Welcome to the holiday episode of This Week in Sales. You know, I've been making a list and checking it twice. And you naughty boys and girls out there have been asking for some of the best sales questions that you should be asking your prospects. Well, your holiday wishes are granted on today's episode of This Week in Sales. You may recall the goal of the show is to help sales professionals with tips and tactics and techniques to help them improve their performance right now. Today's guest is Jeb Brooks, the Executive Vice President at the Brooks Group, which is a sales and sales management uh, training firm in North Carolina. Jeb, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Kevin. You're welcome. Jeb, what's your nightmare sales job? Nightmare sales job. Uh, I've got to say, it's, it's, it would be anything where I didn't believe that what I, was, what I had to sell would bring value to my customer. In other words, if I don't, if I don't believe that I have something that, that can make a difference for my prospect and customer, I, I, don't, I don't think I could sell it. Because you think anybody could sell something like that? There are people out there who are doing it, and, and i got to say, they've got a tough road to hoe if they're trying to do that. Yeah, yeah, if you, don't, uh, if you don't believe, for sure. Well, let me give you a proper intro, and then uh, we'll, we'll make our guests' holiday wishes come true. What do you say? Sounds good. Good. Well, as, uh, as mentioned, Jeb Brooks is the executive vice president at the Brooks Group, one of the world's top 10 sales training firms as ranked by Selling Power magazine this year. Uh, he's a sought-after commentator on sales and sales management issues, having appeared in numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal. Jeb authored the second edition of the book, Perfect Phrases for the Sales Call, which we'll be talking about today, and is currently updating the classic book, High Impact Selling, and writes for the Brooks Group's popular blog. You can visit Jeb and learn more about the Brooks Group at www.brooksgroup.com. So, uh, so Jeb, you, you wrote and revised you know, the second edition of the perfect, uh, perfect Phrases for the Sales Call recently. Um, why the update? Why bother? Yeah, it, great, great question. It was it was first put out in in 2006, uh, and it was really a response to um, a, a desire among a lot of salespeople, and I'm sure our listeners today uh, would agree with this. That that you know, if I could just get a couple of uh, silver bullets, what's what, what do I say here? What do I say now? And if I if I if I get that that phrase. Uh, then maybe that'll make the difference. And so that was the original premise of the book, and, and it was remarkably successful. Uh, it was remarkably successful in, in, in achieving that goal. But even since 2006, Kevin, sales has changed dramatically. I mean, it's, it's just a different world out there. So the ideas um, uh, that worked uh, four or five years ago, it's just a little bit different now. I mean, uh, salespeople don't have to be selling for very long to realize that uh, the prospects they're with now are just different uh, than they were than they were in the past. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure your your audience has seen that, and I know many of your other guests have said the same thing. So that was really the purpose for the update to reflect this change, these changes. That's great. Well, I'm glad you're you're staying current. Certainly, I know that there's. Those you know trigger phrases that people are always looking for, salespeople are looking for. Um, you know, when I was selling uh, on the phone my, myself, I always I wanted to to find that you know that top producer out there and that one little thing that they said that sort of encapsulated you know the right uh, the, the right message at the at the right time, and that then became the the foundation. So I'm glad that you've taken the the ch- the challenge to update the book. But let's let's go for the throat here. What are some of those more effective phrases that salespeople and sales professionals should be using right now in uh, today's new sales economy? I, I, I want to give you a handful. I want to give the, the listeners today a handful of, of the ones we talk about in the book. But, but before I do that, I know there's this great debate out there uh, on scripts versus not using scripts. You know, there, there are a lot of salespeople who believe passionately in the power of them, uh, and there are a lot who believe uh, passionately that they're a bad thing. And it's our premise in the book that, in fact, it's a happy medium. 
you need to take the phrases that we present in the book or that, that I'm going to talk about here in a few minutes uh, and make them yours. In other words, uh, you and I, uh, uh, Kevin, have two different speech patterns, and you speak differently than I do. And if I try to model exactly what you say and the way you say it, um, anybody who's listening to me is going to be able to tell that I'm playing somebody else's role. It, you see it in, in Hollywood all the time. A good actor can own that script and make it his own. And that's, that's what I encourage uh, folks to do with, with what we talk about today. So I'd like to talk about um, what we call our statement of intention. Uh, along with that, our primary bonding statement. Let me talk about uh, what I call the summary statement and then uh, the stacking formula. So that's about four phrases that I think folks can uh, walk away from today's program and, and use, uh, uh, making their own, of course. Now, of course, uh, the statement of intention. At the front end of a sales interview, what we call the, the probing of, 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 a, uh, of a sales, of a prospect, where you, you ask those meaningful questions, understand the reasons why somebody might buy, we encourage you to combine a statement of intention with a primary bonding statement. Now, statement of intention does this just what it says. It simply tells your prospect why you're there and more importantly why they're there. Too often we, we just jump into a, a sales presentation without I guess stating our, our intended outcomes without saying this is what we want to do today. How does that sound or is that okay with you? Um, and we also don't make that connection with that prospect. Instead we've got kind of a canned presentation, what some people call a pitch, a term that, that we hate. But without, without making it, uh, making it uh, uh, relevant. So statement of attention works like this. Let me give you a, um, a script that works for me. It may or may not work for you, but, but, but make it your own. Um, yeah, good morning, Kevin. Uh, I'm Jeb. It's, it's certainly good to meet with you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, if it's all right with you, I'd like to take the opportunity to meet you and uh, for us together to determine uh, whether there's some way uh, my company and I might be able to be of service to you and your organization. Is that okay with you? Uh, there's a pretty good chance your response is, is yeah, that's fine with me. Uh, we can talk about wh what happens if, if, if they say no. But if that's, if that's okay, then you can move ahead. Now, what have we done there? We've simply said uh, why we're there. I'd like to take this opportunity to meet you. My goal, Kevin, is to meet you and then to work together to determine whether we, uh, we can work together uh, in a way that's meaningful to you, that in essence brings value to your organization and to ours. Does that make sense, the statement of intention? Mm -hmm, absolutely, and I, I'm a big believer, but I think that there's a lot of, um, you, you said that that statement of intention helps make the connection between the prospect and the, and the salesperson there, but doesn't small talk achieve the same thing? How's the weather out there? Those Niners really beat the pants off of your, your, your Steelers on Monday. Isn't that, doesn't that accomplish the same thing? Uh, you, you brought up my, my absolute favorite piece of, of research that we've done uh, in the history of our company. Um, for 35 years we've been in this business and, and each year we look, at, uh, we look at additional research to make sure that salespeople that we work with are as effective as they possibly can. And th this one little fact is, is something that's amazing to me. Uh, Kevin, over 74% of business-to-business -business buyers out there dislike unsolicited small talk. They, they, they dislike it. You know, that, how, how, about the, how about the Niners or, you know, the weather or, oh, you like sailing or tell me about your family. They don't like that. Now, only eight-tenths of one percent will tell you they don't like it. But 74% of them don't like it. So in order to make that connection, uh, the, better, the better way to do it than small talk is, is what we call the primary bonding statement. And that, that works this way. You combine it with a statement of intention. So again, uh, if it's all right with you, I'd like to take the opportunity to meet you, uh, determine together whether there's some way that your company and ours might be able to, to work together so we can be of service to you. Um, and our real goal in doing that is to help you get what you get what you want. And in my experience, that often means X. To help us do that, do you, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Mm -hmm. So what I've done there is I, I'm exhibiting that, that the reason I'm here is to help you get what you're, what you're after, which is usually whatever it is your research has determined 
is, is what they're looking for. Mm. And you know your prospects and your customers better than I do. But, but that's, that piece right there, to build that instant connection is, is pretty powerful. Gotcha. So drop the small talk, hey Jeb? Get rid of it, folks. It's, it's, it's just, it's wasteful. You, you know, there's a pretty good chance you don't like it either when somebody does it to you. Yeah, it's, it's so, uh, so fake and, and so obvious. But let me go the other extreme, though. Your, your, the statement of intention in that, that primary bonding statement uh, sounds fairly dry to me. I mean, how in the, ha I mean, how could we build a relationship with somebody and make that connection with a phrase that is so dry that, you know what, you've probably used that a thousand times with a thousand different prospects. Sounds kind of dry. What, what, what am I missing here? Are Fair we not state, building, are we yeah. not, not building a relationship or, or are we? We are, we are, but that's a fair statement that it can sound dry, which again, takes us back. Let's, you know, let's make it our own. Let's make it, whatever we say to a prospect or customer, let's own it. Um, but you, you're right. We do want to build a, tr build a relationship, but a relationship that's built on trust, not being liked. Um, here's, here's a fact. 64% of all buyers uh, uh, have said, uh, this is a, a project we did a couple of years ago now, but 64% of those buyers said that they didn't trust any of the salespeople <laughs> they've bought something from in the last 24 months. So what does this tell us? They actually bought something from these salespeople, but they still don't trust them. And if, if, if many of your listeners are, as, as I am, attempting to build a longer-term relationship that's built on more than just one order, we need, to, we need to seek that trust. And trust comes from being professional. And that's what that, um, in, in among many other things, but being professional. And that's what that statement of intention and primary bonding statement do. Yes, they're a little dry. But um, so is your doctor, and so is your lawyer. And you, you probably, well, <laughs> maybe not the lawyer, but you probably trust them. And so what you want to do is build a relationship that's built on trust. Got it. Your dad always said, better be, better be trusted than to be liked, right? That's absolutely, we, nothing could, that is, that's one of those universal principles that has spanned the test of time. Excellent. All right, let's, let's keep giving our, our audience what they're looking for here, more, more phrases that pay. Sure, sure. I'll give you. I'll give you another one. Let's take it to the end of the of the sales interaction. So, so we talked about what to do with the front end of a of a of a, a sales interaction. But once you've uncovered that information, what do you do with it? So you've asked some great uh, questions that have have yielded you some really useful information about what your prospect wants to to buy. And and we'll kind of keep this in the hypothetical. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for that. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of people selling a lot of different things uh, on the line, I'm sure. So uh, let's keep it let's keep it kind of generic and use the summary statement. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those examples of things that everybody knows to do, not unlike the summary or the, the statement of intention. But there's a, a great old book by a couple guys, Pfeffer and Sutton. Uh, it's a Harvard Business uh, a book called The Knowing Doing Gap, uh, and it's got some age on it, but it's a good one. And it talks about the difference uh, between what you know and what you actually do. And uh, one of the things that comes out of that book, when all is said and done, more is said than done. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. So, so here's what I encourage you to do is take note of the summary statement and realize that it's something you probably know, but then test yourself to see if you're actually doing it. So you've uncovered, let's say, four things that your prospect is looking for, four things that your product or service can deliver. Let's say they're 24-7 um, customer service, 99% uptime, uh, easy upgrades, and uh, a simple user interface, okay? Mm -hmm. Make it some kind of a software as a service, all right? This is, is as simple as this, the summary statement. After you've uncovered all of that, based on what I understand, Kevin, uh, you're looking for 24-7 customer service, 99% uh, uptime, easy upgrades, and a simple user interface. Is, is that correct, or did I miss anything? Very good. Why is That's that important, it. though? Because what you're doing is you're checking in. All right, what this is doing is saying, based on our conversation, I think that these are the areas that, that you're interested in. Just, you know, what did I miss? Did I get something completely wrong, uh, uh, or did I did I not hear something? And you know, eight times out of ten, uh, you'll you'll get some feedback on that. And 
often the feedback will be, well, yeah, I wanted those four things, but I also want it ex integrated into our existing system. I want it to be seamless. Well, that gives you an opportunity to probe a little bit more, understand why that's important, because often what we see happen when we're observing salespeople is that last thing that comes up as a result of that check-in at the end is sometimes the most important. And it just took that amount of time to, uh, to sort of build that, that mini relationship during the sales interaction to, to, to reveal that piece. Right. So, so what, you, what you've gotten then is you've, you've discovered five things that they're after. And, and you've got that summary statement, which allows you to then build a proposal uh, based on those, on those five things. And you understand where the value lies for them. And uh, you can highlight that in, in, in when you're doing, doing that proposal or that, that letter or however you present it. Right. Excellent. Yeah, Bill. So this is, I think you're right on. People are know they should be doing things like this, but they don't do that. This is classic active listening for those out there. Just from what I understand, what I hear you saying is you're looking for X, Y, and Z. And by the way, God help you if you don't have a notepad and you're writing these things down. It's not disrespectful. What's even more disrespectful, by the way, is if you get something wrong because you're relying on memory and then you come back and you propose the wrong wrong thing or wrong solution, you're wasting everybody's time. So the summary statement, Jeb, I agree with you, allows you to, to check in, take that pulse. Hey, if I understand you correctly, these are the four things that are important to you. How does that sound to you? Did I miss anything? And you can move back into the probe if, uh, if need be to uh, clarify a, a few points there, which gives you a wonderful foundation uh, to, to move forward. So um, let's keep moving forward ourselves here. Give me another, another phrase that pays. Yeah, we, we promised four. So here's, here's, here's one more. Here's the fourth. Um, we call it the stacking formula. And it comes out of a, a book we, we put out about uh, uh, 2007, I think, called uh, How to Sell at Margins Higher Than Your Competitors. So how can you sell when you're not the lowest priced competitor? And here is one of, I, I think, the best pieces out of that book. And it's, it's um, we'll, we'll, let's extend the example, if we could, Kevin, from the last little piece, those, those five elements that came out that were important. Um, so... What you want to do, and, and I'll explain this um, verbally, so how you'd present this if you're meeting on the phone or you're uh, meeting face-to-face, -face. and then let's talk a little bit about um, how to do it in a, in a formal written proposal because uh, some, some, some of your listeners might be using that. So the stacking formula works this way. So, um, so Kevin, I understand you, you're looking for 24-7 customer service because you know everybody in your organization needs ready access to somebody who can – uh, who can help them with any problems that might might come. Um, you're also looking for 99% uptime, so you don't have to worry about the system being down, and you want easy access to upgrades. So the cost is $4,000 a month, and the price also includes the simple user interface that you've, that you've seen and complete integration with your existing system, which you pointed out in our last meeting was important to you. How does that sound? So what we've done there is we've listed benefit, 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 price, benefit, benefit. In essence, burying the price in amongst all these great things that your prospect or your customer has said they wanted. So what you're doing there in, in the mind of your, of your prospect is minimizing that cost and maximizing the value. You see, salespeople, I think, focus on price too much mm. and customers tend to focus on cost too much. So as salespeople, it becomes our job to become value interpreters and focus instead on that value, because that's a whole lot more meaningful than either price or cost, because that's the actual impact. And that's what the stacking formula does. So how do we do this um, in a written proposal? Uh, this is one of my favorites. Um, if I get a... Um, an emailed proposal to me for something that we're looking at here at the Brooks Group, inevitably what we'll do is, uh, is I'll get it printed out and I'll just flip to the last page and there's the price. <laughs> yep. <laughs> We've all done it. So what you can do is build a proposal if you have the ability to, to manipulate your own, uh, your own uh, uh, proposals, and this goes for uh, anybody out there who, can, who has, has some flexibility here, to build it as the stacking formula. So in other, in other words, Value, value, value. Put the price somewhere in the middle of that 
proposal and then more value, value, value. So what you're doing is you're requiring uh, whoever gets a hold of that printed proposal or that emailed proposal to read the whole thing and see the value you're bringing, not just the cost. Uh, but even better than that, and I am reasonably confident that all of your uh, all of your viewers out there uh, uh, would never find themselves just emailing a proposal off. Hmm. Uh, make sure that if you if you if you have the opportunity to go over that proposal, whether it's in person or whether it's um, uh, via WebEx or uh, or Adobe Connect or whatever whatever tool you use, so that you're able to interpret that value. Again, I go back to what I said earlier. Salespeople are, should be, need to be, have to be value interpreters. Right. I love that. I love that phrase. That's such an ongoing debate out there, by the way, Jeb. The do I send? They've asked for the proposal. Do I just send it? You know, they said just send it. You know, whatever. And uh, and I actually wanted to put that one to rest uh, at my last company. And so we evaluated that. We evaluated all the closes that came from proposals that were just emailed, and the bluebirds came through the window, of course, uh, or not. And then the ones where. No, I'm not going to just email it. You know, there's just more to it than that. So we need to set some time to go through it together. And it was just uh, so eye-opening to the salespeople as well to myself that just sending it out there, crossing your fingers, and, and hoping that that thing is going to come back uh, closed. Um, it, what the probabilities were so so low. The, the percentages were so so low because we lost our leverage. We were handing it out, and there was really nothing left to do besides. Hey, just checking in. Did you get the proposal? And all those really horrible ways to to make uh, subsequent steps in the in the sales process there. But um, I want to keep our, our users moving forward here, Jeb. You um, you've written uh, actually a very popular blog post called "37 B 2 B Sales Questions." What's the secret to an effective sales question? Yeah, because we and we 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 talked about the front end and the and the and the back end. Let's let's dig into the content uh, of that sales interaction, which is questions. I, I'm not <laughs> I'm not revealing any great secret to say that successful selling is about questions because everybody knows that. Um, but I think that that what happens is we a lot of salespeople end up focusing on the needs uh, and whether uh, whether this prospect has needs that I can meet when we need to go a little deeper than that. So if, I, if I'm selling, um, if I'm selling a, a pump, for example, is there, is there enough um, uh, fluid that flows through this particular um, element that uh, my pump will do the trick? Or if I'm selling um, uh, storage, is, is, does, does this need uh, have, uh, have more storage or is there's more storage need than I can fulfill in this particular application or what have you. What we really need to look at with an effective question is understand why somebody would want to buy from you in the first place. So uh, I'll give you a medical device uh, example. Um, let's say there's a company out there that has a brand new MRI machine and the MRI machine is vastly more expensive than any other MRI machine out there and they're already pretty expensive. Why would a hospital administrator or, uh, or, or chief of medicine want to buy that machine? Well, it, it may fulfill the need that the cheaper machine does, but if it turns out that through that sales interview we, we uncover that the chief of medicine or whoever has a desire to be recognized in the profession as a cutting edge type of person, and that want, that want, that need to, to, to be recognized comes to the surface, then our questioning is much more effective than how much space do you have to put a, an MRI machine there? So an effective B2B sales question gets at the reasons why someone would want to buy from you. Is that, it sounds to me like what you're saying is to create leading questions. Not necessarily, in, in fact, not at all. Uh, I think those are manipulative and, 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 and can often be offensive. Uh, but instead, what you want to do is, is ask open-ended questions that allow that uh, person to, to reveal what it is they want. Now, this requires trust, so it takes us back to that statement of intention, that professional relationship. We need to build trust and credibility, which of course takes time, but uh, uh, I, I am 
opposed to those uh, those leading questions, those tie down questions. I think they're they're old school. I don't think they work anymore. Um, I'm surprised they ever worked, uh, but I guess <laughs> they did. Yeah, at one point in time, right? Okay, good. Well, with the time that we've got left on the show, then Jeb, what are some of your your the five favorite B two B sales questions we should be asking during the probing phase of a call? My absolute favorite is. No matter what somebody says, just curious, Kevin, uh, why do you say that? Allow them to, to, to reveal a little bit more. Just, just get a little bit more information, a couple of more. Uh, let, me, let me give you the basics. What kind of time frame are you looking for? Uh, what's that sense of urgency? Um, my all, one of my all-time, I think all these are my favorites, but uh, who else, other than you, of course, Kevin, uh, is involved in this decision? You're not being offensive by uh, asking that. You're, you're recognizing this person's role in the decision, but who else is hanging out there in this process? Um, what prompted your interest? You know, what, what caused you to, to become interested in our offering? And, um, depending on the style of the person you're meeting with, uh, here are a few. What will this decision mean to your team? If this is kind of a more uh, uh, friendly, kind of accommodating person. What will this mean to your bottom line? If it's, a, if it's a more uh, direct uh, uh, bottom line kind of a person? Or, or what will this mean to your career? What will this decision mean to your career? So there are, there are four or five questions that I think are pretty, pretty good ones. I've been furiously scribbling a bunch of these down here, but let's, let's talk about that, uh, those last few ones. What does this uh, purchase or decision mean to your team? What does this decision uh, mean to your career? Those are, uh, that, that's, what do you expect to get out of a question like that? And I, can we ask that question like right out of the gate? Absolutely not. This again goes back to trust. You know, um, as we're working on a white paper right now that's kind of looking at this question of when can somebody ask these sorts of questions, and it's certainly a um, a hierarchy. You know, if you're if you're a uh, if you're a a vendor, it's going to be tough. But as you move up a, a up and and become more of a consultant, more of an, a, a a partner uh, kind of relationship, those those questions become much easier to ask. Now, uh, so to answer your question, if I ask that question and I have, what will this mean to your career? And I have no relationship whatsoever with somebody. I'm going to get a door slammed in my face or a uh, telephone hung up on me, what have you. However, if I have a strategic kind of consultative kind of, I mean, uh, partner type relationship, those are kind of three buzzwords you hear out there all the time, but a, a very good, meaningful relationship, and I ask that question, I'm going to get some real value, some real sales gold out of it. In, give me a sales story. What, what kind of real things have you heard prospects say when you ask them, what, what does this decision mean to your career that was particularly eye-opening to you? What have you heard in the past, Jeb? So I, I, let, me, let me give you a story about what will this mean, what, what will this mean to your team. Uh, sure. We're in the sales training business. And, and so I was working with a company. They sell, um, um, they sell uh, a sort of component part for uh, basically in the medical space. So what will this mean to your team? And the, uh, the, my prospect was a VP of sales uh, over the North American division. Uh, he was overseeing about 25 salespeople. And he said, you know what, right now, um, paraphrasing, but you know what, right now our team is fragmented. Right now our team doesn't know what they're doing. So if we can get them all on the same page, it's going to mean a lot of good things for the team. But more importantly, it's going to mean something for me. It's going to make my job easier. So what was he saying? We install process. So we work with companies to help them uh, build and install methodology and process to their sales efforts. And he was managing, he was herding cats in essence, okay? He was herding cats and trying to get these 25 reps to, to do something that was consistent. And you had, he had 25 people doing 25 different things uh, all across the country. So what will this mean to his team brought up this career related, uh, kind of personal related uh, uh, response that helped me understand he didn't want sales training. He wanted to sleep a little better at night. He wanted to have this relief so that people weren't, uh, um, people weren't causing him all kinds of stress and annoyance, right? Right, excellent. So how I'm fascinated by this and hopefully our audience is as well. 
You've got that gem of information. You've dug, dug deeper than 99% of the salespeople out there, Jeb, and you've found out that sales training means maybe more of a work-life balance, maybe means that they get more sleep at, uh, at night, that they know that things are, even though there's salespeople all over the place, that things are working just that much better for them, uh, and they don't have to stress out as much. When you've got that gem of information, what do you do with it then? I'll, I'll take you back to where we were just a few minutes ago. Based on what I understand, uh, Joe, uh, you're looking to, to have a team that's a little bit more consistent so that you uh, are able to have a little, bit, uh, a little bit less stress in your life. Uh, in order to do that, I'd like to recommend uh, this particular training initiative, which I've outlined right here on this, uh, in this, uh, this proposal. Do you mind if we take a look at it? Excellent. And then do you say you're going to get this, this, sleep well at night, only for $100,000, one-time fee, and you also get X and Y? That's, we stack it, absolutely. And stacking Excellent. works uh, regardless of, of the benefits you're looking for, regardless of the price point. Uh, it's, it, the, the psychological effect of minimizing that price uh, at the expense of value works at, at all levels of numbers. Excellent. Wonderful. Great. Well, so that's all we have for the show this week. Jeb, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you to your audience. This has been a, a whole lot of fun. You're welcome. Fun for me as well. So if you have any additional questions for us or topics that you want to suggest for the show, which is where this show came from, as a matter of fact, email me at askkevin at thisweekend.com. Of course, like our Facebook page, This Week in Sales. And of course, you can tweet at us at Sales Week. You can also find us on YouTube. That's youtube.com forward slash show forward slash This Week in Sales. And of course, don't forget to download our iTunes podcast. That's all we have for this week. Have a wonderful holiday, and we'll see you in the new year.